Welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. How come everybody asks, where is my artillery, but nobody ever stops to ask, how is my artillery? It's been three months since the start of the war in Ukraine, and the past month it's been a full-on artillery duel in the east. Or maybe a better word would be slog. Putin has 110 remaining battalion tactical groups deployed in Ukraine that have been slowly getting picked off one by one, so he needs to make a move very soon. It's time now to unravel this second phase of the war in eastern Ukraine and analyze whether or not Russian forces can hope to achieve their goal of encircling the Ukrainian troops in the Donbass region. What's at stake here is well over $50 billion of international aid money that odds are you and I, our tax money is involved in this, and the future of the people of the entire region. Right now, we're seeing the results of the planning and preparation phase that many people thought was the war grinding into a stalemate. Moscow and Kiev have been busy moving and repositioning their forces in preparation for what finally happened today, Sunday, May 29th, when they both launched major ground offensives. The moment of truth is upon us. The Ukrainians are actually pushing forward in Kyrgyzstan, and the Russians are storming the city of Severodonsk. I think the Russians might have made a mistake here by sending all of their best troops and modern equipment to the east. They left their flank in Kyrgyzstan wide open, and now the Ukrainians are calling their bluff. The Russian units have been reinforced with these ancient, obsolete 1960s T-62 tanks that they brought in just last week. It's like fighting in a dang time machine. In the background of all of this, Putin just got some extra political ammunition with Finland and Sweden joining NATO. So now he can point to that and say, I told you so, NATO is expanding, forcing me to invade everyone. Look what you made me do. You think I want to hit you, babe? Stop joining NATO, everything will be okay, promise. This comes down to the question as old as time itself. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Russian aggression or NATO expansionism? I think we can all agree that God created both and evolution is fake news. Saturday, May 27th, Russian forces started their direct ground assault of the key eastern city of Severodonsk. This movement was reinforced with troops that they pulled from every single other axis of attack. They've gone all in on this one city that holds very little strategic and economic value, but has tons of political capital, as it will allow Putin to say he's fully captured the Luhansk territory. There are conflicting reports about the extent of how much of the city has been surrounded at this point. The Russians claim that they've completely cut the city off, while the Ukrainians say only one third is still left open as of today, Sunday, May 29th, and they claim to still have one single remaining supply line out of the city. The city has a pre war population of 100,000 now. It's down to a population of 15,000 people who are unable or unwilling to leave. The governor of Luhansk came out yesterday and said that the Russians were already in the city and that the Ukrainian forces might have to retreat at this point as of today in order to avoid being surrounded. Almost 90% of the city has been destroyed by RAF shelling over the past month. They flattened this place like they did with Mariupol. The Institute of the Study of War, a Washington-based think tank of military analysts, believe that the city will be captured by the Russian armed forces possibly in the next few days, but they don't rule out the possibility that the Ukrainians could pull off another Kiev defense here and force them to retreat. The RAF, the Russian armed forces, broke out the big guns for this fight by deploying a new vehicle to this city called the BMPT, Terminator. It was created in 2011, so it's one of the most modern vehicles in their arsenal. The entire design philosophy of this Terminator is to conquer close quarters urban city centers. That's why I want to talk about this vehicle for a quick second. The twin 30 millimeter auto cannons on it, four missile launchers, and twin grenade launchers give it unparalleled firepower. I mean it, this vehicle is unlike any weapon in Western NATO forces. It has twice the firepower of your traditional BMP or what the Bradley has. It's a cross between a T-72 chassis and the BMP all combined together. Russia has about 300 of these produced so far, but only 10 of them have been confirmed to be deployed to Ukraine so far, so that's only about one company of the Terminators that we've seen in video evidence. Just check out this definitely not staged at all video where this guy is just naturally waving at the BMPT. He definitely doesn't seem like they paid him a bunch of rubles to wave at those tanks. Definitely not. Totally natural. The Russians reached the outskirts of Severodinsk and they captured what's called the Pasia Hotel. According to the governor of the city, the Russians have concentrated about 25 of their battalion tactical groups here, which works out to about 10,000 troops. So we're seeing these repositioning, we're seeing them moving their pieces on the chessboard, 
they think that this is going to be the best place to reinforce their forces. The Russians are hoping the development of this weapon will help them make up for the fact that they've failed to completely encircle the city so far. Without successfully crossing the Severodonsk Donats River and cutting off the last major supply line to the city, they're at a disadvantage. They need something to turn the tide in their favor. This development was surprising for me because Russia has kept many of their next generation vehicles like the T-14 out of the fight so far. I don't think the Terminator will be enough on its own to make much of a difference in the Battle of Severodonsk. My evidence for this is that we've recently seen other new armored vehicles being deployed by Moscow with little effect. The T-90M was also held back by Russia and not deployed until very recently. Only 100 models are in service so far. It was only fielded starting in 2020 with major upgrades like slat armor and new thermal targeting systems. But the T-90M tank was destroyed almost as soon as it reached the front lines in Ukraine at the counteroffensive in Kharkiv. The city of Lyman, with a pre-war population of 20,000, was also captured by Russian forces on Friday, May 27th. This is seen as another major success for the Russians because it's a strategically important city. Lyman's railroad networks, as you can see, it branches out all over the country. This was how the Ukrainian armed forces were able to quickly reposition their forces from Kiev in the west all the way to the east now. It's how they were quickly able to send western shipments of supplies and weapons into the Donbass region. I followed the railroad tracks on satellite images to confirm that they lead out of Ukraine into Russia and they could be used by Russians to send reinforcements into eastern Ukraine now. This gives the RAF, Russian Armed Forces, a foothold and a headquarters from which they can launch the next phase of their plan, which is by far the most difficult phase. They want to completely encircle the Donsk region, trying to finally pull off this dreaded encirclement that we've been hearing about for the past month. The UAF is quickly losing ground in eastern Ukraine at the moment, but strategic withdrawal and pulling the Russians further into traps has worked in the past. And this leads us to the puzzle. The puzzle is how I refer to the war fitting together in eastern Ukraine. Each piece is connected to the other, and they need to come together for the grand strategy to work for Russia. In order to understand the Battle of Severodonsk that's happening right now, we need to look at how the whole picture fits together and how one battle has consequences for another. Near the city of Kharkiv, Ukrainian forces over the past month have led a successful counterattack by pushing the Russians all the way back to their international border in some locations. The video of Ukrainian soldiers at the border possibly confused some people into thinking no Russians remained in the area, but they have yet to be completely repelled from there. Most of the Ukrainian counteroffensive pushed to within 15 miles of the border, where they then stopped. The front of this attack was long, 90 kilometer long arc, and the Russians retreated back. They destroyed bridges as they were retreating away from Kharkiv to slow down the Ukrainians who were advancing on them. This is a serious tactical measure to take, and according to the Institute for the Study of War, it suggests that they have no plans to return to Kharkiv, the city proper, anytime soon. At first, they pushed the RAF so far back that they were out of artillery range, out of the city, but the lines of battle have settled where they can still launch rocket attacks on Kharkiv today. The big question is why can't the RAF fully retreat from Kharkiv like they did near Kiev, Sumy, and Charniv in the north? If they pulled back entirely, it would free up thousands of soldiers and it would allow them to reinforce their more important battles in the south. Here is where the puzzle starts to fit together. The reason why they can't afford to do that is because the Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkiv is aiming to cut off the ground lines of communication and supply lines that lead into Izium. The UAF counterattack is within 30 kilometers of cutting off Russian supplies to Izium. The T2114 highway is their main supply route. If Ukrainians are able to cut that T2114 highway off, they would prevent the grand strategy of encirclement of the Donbass. So you see how all of these battles fit together now. Russia stands to encircle and capture nearly 40,000 Ukrainian soldiers fighting in this pocket here. Without continuing to defend Kharkiv, Russia cannot hope to successfully capture and hold on to Severodensk. The war in eastern Ukraine is far more interconnected like this than it was in Kiev. On a macro level, when we zoom out and look at the wider goals of the Russian war machine that we want to keep in mind throughout this, because it's their whole strategy for this part of the war, they want to push south from Izium and link up with their forces that are pushing north currently. 
Originally, they wanted to take a wide berth and push out far to the west, which would allow them to encircle the entire Donbass region. They need Slavonsk, Karmatsky, and Severodonsk to do that. After being stalled and having to withdraw troops from their offensive to defend their supply lines, they shifted their goals again and tried to do an even smaller cutoff. As of today, May 29th, Sunday, the Russian advances are largely stalled on the Izium Axis. So the only question is now, how wide and big is this encirclement going to end up being? Russian forces have now taken total control of 95% of Luhansk and about 50% of Donsk. This encirclement would give them 100%, and they could then claim full control of the Donbass region. The Institute for the Study of War, in their analysis, claims that the Russian forces are no longer in position to capture Donsk, and they've been limiting their goals to capturing only the Luhansk region now, so only that key city of Severodonsk. Listen, I get it, sometimes you gotta move the goalposts and aim a little lower. I've been doing it my whole life now. Ukraine offered Russian soldiers amnesty and 5 million rubles or 45,000 USD to lay down their arms and surrender to them. I'll be honest, if the enemy in Iraq had made me the same offer, I'd be living in Baghdad smoking apple hookah right now. The other strange thing about this Kharkiv counteroffensive is we have this situation where Ukrainian soldiers who are fighting in Kiev were redirected to now fight in Kharkiv, and the Russians did the same exact thing. So basically the same troops who faced off against each other in Kiev are now battling against each other, except in a different location some 300 kilometers away. Couldn't we have just skipped the whole exhausting movement thing? The reinforcements is working for Russia so far though. They've been able to stall that counterattack in Kharkiv. But how were Ukrainian forces able to make this much of an advancement when it's so difficult to change from defensive operations to offensive ones. Ukrainian President Zelensky admitted yesterday that his forces were likely losing between 50 and 100 soldiers each day on this front, a pace that will be hard to keep up. Forbes pointed out that at this rate, it's possible that Ukrainian forces might have lost up to 9,000 troops so far in the war. That's, that's when you do 96 days times 100 days each. The average infantrymen on both sides are starting to become fatigued and worn down at this point. Three months of being moved around Ukraine, repositioned, the natural rhythm of war follows this pace of short bursts of high intensity, followed by longer periods of regrouping and reorganizing. Right now, this week is a high intensity combat phase, after which the map and the realities of the war may look very different. Let's talk about the next piece of the puzzle and how it all fits together. Today, the Ukrainians launched their major counteroffensive from Kherson, a city with a population of 300,000 people. I don't think it's a coincidence that they chose this moment to attack because it's directly after the Russians assault in Severodonsk. Right now it's occupied territory. All of the operations there remind me of what it looked like when we were operating in Iraq. The Ukrainians are trying to exploit the fact that the Russians pulled some of their combat power away from Kyrgyzstan and redirected it to the east. This means this is their best possible moment to strike. It's now or never. Forbes reported that a Ukrainian MiG-29 fighter jet shot down one of Russia's best, greatest, and meanest jets of all time, the Su-35, near Kyrgyzstan on May 27th, Friday, just a few days ago. The Ukrainian's 5th Tank Brigade that has been about, it's about 100 T-72s, is leading this counterattack into Kyrgyzstan from Mykolai. They were reportedly able to make a river crossing successfully at the Inuits River, thanks to the American 777 that supported their movement forward and they kept the skies clear. This is a huge movement. We haven't seen a major ground offensive attempt like this in over a month. And the fact that they successfully crossed that river is massive news because we're gonna see in just a minute how the Russians crossing went. The 5th Tank Brigade of Ukraine is finally able to support combat operations. For the past month, they had to sit back and defend Odessa, but after sinking the Russian flagship vessel, the Moskava, they no longer need to worry about an amphibious assault there. But it's gonna to be tough for them to assault the city. It would be the first time Ukrainian forces would have had to recapture a major urban center. I've been saying this from the beginning, Kyrgyzstan is a very weird, curious case because somehow Ukrainian forces failed to blow the bridges leading there early in the war. There's some early indications that this failure could have been done due to a case of treason by a Ukrainian security service colonel named Ihor Sadakin, who has since been arrested and charged with treason. But the Ukrainians have a massive geographic advantage as defenders. They can blow up bridges while retreating and stretching the Russian supply lines. 
These blown up bridges create choke points that force several thousand Russian forces or multiple battalion tactical groups to pass through one narrow vulnerable area. It's called a kill zone and it's the reason, it's the only reason that the Ukrainian defenders in eastern Ukraine are still holding out even though they are outgunned eight to one. The best example of this situation is in the Russians Donots River crossing. I read a Russian field manual on their own tactics for doing a hasty river crossing. Throughout military history, armies have attempted the incredibly risky maneuver of crossing rivers while under direct fire. Entire field manuals have been written on it, and it's something European armies specifically regularly train on more so than any other forces. The Russians have been forced to cross several rivers during this war while under fire because Ukrainians destroyed bridges. Most of these crossing attempts have been a disaster, but there is no way around them. Sometimes they have to be done. The reason it was vital for the Russians to cross the Donuts River here, because if they were successful, it would allow them to cut off the last remaining supply route to the key city of Severodonsk. So the puzzle pieces are fitting together here. This is how these different battles are all interconnected. And it would complete their attempted pincer movement encircling thousands of Ukrainians. We know they tried to cross the river at this location, likely because the river edge was the least steep here and was the most flat, clear landing zone. I used satellite images to determine that this river behind us is about the same distance as the one that the Russians tried to cross, the Donuts River in Ukraine. So you can't just have one crossing. You need to make sure that there's several other elements from your unit setting up fake crossings so that the defense forces that are trying to prevent you from going across, they're gonna be spread out thin because they're gonna be trying to stop four or five different crossings. They're not gonna know exactly where your true crossing is happening at. First of all, why didn't Russian armored vehicles simply just swim across the river? Why did they use this pontoon bridge? We know the BMP and the BTR are all supposed to be amphibious and double as a Bodie McBoat face. Even the T-72 is meant to have some river fording abilities up to a few meters. The problem is the amphibious abilities have been overhyped. In preparations for this section, I spoke to a former soldier who was a gunner on a BMP in Belarus. He wishes to remain anonymous. He told me the following, apparently buoyancy is not a permanent ability for these vehicles. Many of these infantry fighting vehicles are old and the tightness of the connections have likely been broken. What all this means is that a lot of those vehicles are unable to cross a river without sinking instantly because it takes one to two weeks of daily three to four hours of maintenance and tests to make sure that a BMP vehicle is prepared for an amphibious crossing. So according to this article, the flow of the Donuts River is normally slow, but it can reach up to 2.7 knots in speed, which is just fast enough to throw off and push an amphibious armored vehicle off course. The Donuts is a 650 mile long river that snakes through eastern Ukraine and has provided the Ukrainian armed forces with a natural line of defense. It's basically defined the limits of the Russian advance so far. The PP-91 Pontoon Bridge Company of Russian Army Engineers can create a full bridge in under one hour by the book, but in reality, in practice, it takes closer to two hours. Each section weighs as much of a tank at 40 tons and can hold 60 tons of weight. The Russians only have a very limited amount of bridge crossing equipment because each PMP costs $2.3 million. On May 8th, two battalion tactical groups, including the 74th Separate Guards Motorized Rifle Brigade, the whole movement of about 1,200 total Russian soldiers, 100 vehicles attempted their fateful water crossing. You're supposed to have air superiority to attack any artillery elements in the area. If you don't do those things, you're gonna have a bad day. Just as they were finishing the first pontoon bridge and had gotten 20 armored vehicles across the river, they started taking fire, and that's when the Battle of Donuts River went on for multiple days. But how was the UAF able to mass all their troops on this one location? The Russian forces could have chosen anywhere along the river to try to cross. The answer to that can actually be found in this Twitter thread, where a Ukrainian army engineer basically live tweeted how he outfoxed the Russian army and helped prevent them from crossing the river. See, Twitter isn't just for arguing, it's also for bragging about destroying an entire battalion of Russian soldiers. Definitely worth the buy, Elon. The biggest thing that stuck out to me here with these tweets, crazy, the Russian battalion tactical group tried to make this crossing early in the morning during daylight hours. Crossing like this should be done under the cover of darkness at night to avoid what happened to them. It could be that they didn't have the night vision equipment necessary for that. The forces that did make it across the first bridge tried to retreat once the pontoon bridge was hit and destroyed. They were stranded on that side of the river and picked off. 
The Russians attempted to set up another bridge, but that was destroyed too. Military analysts point out that the turrets on the Russian tanks are facing back across the river, showing how they were trying to retreat while firing backwards. All told, the failed river crossing was said to be one of the most lethal engagements of the war so far for the Russian army. Over 400 Russian soldiers were KIA. It made two mechanized infantry battalions with engineers and 70 to 80 IFVs and tanks combat ineffective. There were only 15 to 20 survivors, according to the preliminary reports from the field, which are backed up by these images. Even if Russian forces are able to capture Severodonsk without crossing the river, it will come at a much greater price now. Many more soldiers will perish because of that failure. To be completely fair, the Ukrainian army also has had to resort to using the old T-64. Here we see one of their tanks is moving forward trying to investigate. The warfare in eastern Ukraine is armored tank-on-tank -tank battles, very different from the fight for Kiev. Turns out they fell for a trap. They were baited out into the open by the enemy. Now one of the downsides of having this old tank is that it doesn't have a stabilized cannon. So they're unable to fire while moving. You see they stop but they still miss. Fortunately for them, the Russians also miss with their first shot. Now, as the Ukrainians are retreating away, they see that they're outnumbered by at least probably four to one here. They take a direct hit to the rear of the tank that's the most vulnerable part of the armor on the T-64. Fortunately, the crew of the tank is able to escape in time. They're able to get out of there. Many military analysts and think tanks believe we're seeing the culmination of their Russian combat power at this point, and they will not be able to project further into the Donbass region after capturing this city of Severodonsk. During the invasion phase of the war, these troops are usually put through intense combat, but it's supposed to be for a short period of time. That's how the US invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan were handled. To say all the money that we're sending there starts to give me a few conflicting thoughts if I'm gonna be honest and try to be a little bit nuanced about this. Why is it worth $40 billion to stop Russia from taking over Ukraine? I believe it's because the US government ran a cost-benefit analysis and they decided that paying Ukraine 40 billion now is cheaper than whatever it would cost them on the back end if the Russians took over the whole country. The sense that we're sending the Ukrainian people enough weapons at this point to keep fighting Russia and keep throwing themselves into a meat grinder while not giving them the type of heavy weapons necessary to entirely stop Russia in their tracks. I hope I'm not crazy. I hope I'm not the only one concerned about this. Next week, I'll have an update on how these maneuvers turned out and we'll have much more of a clear picture of how successful each ground assault has been. I hope I'll be bringing you good news about the Ukrainian successes, but as always, I remain cautiously optimistic.